hello. Welcome to SUU's Continuing Academic and Enrichment Communities REITS program. So glad you could join us today. I'm your host, Nicole Stout, and with me today is Marilee Ayer. Hey, Marilee. And I'm sorry, I've been pronouncing your last name wrong this whole time. So Marilee Ayer, I'm so glad that you're here. So Marilee Ayer taught at Beaver High School for 28 years and currently serves on SUU's Board of Trustees. She graduated with a double major in English and Business Education from Southern Utah University, where she was the outstanding English student and one of four outstanding business education students. Marilee completed her master's in education from Southern Utah University, as well as administrative and ESL endorsements. She was an adjunct professor at Southern Utah University and she was selected Teacher of the Year and Utah Girls Golf Coach of the Year. Marilee has served as an advanced placement English literature reader and table leader at the AP Reading and is an AP consultant and mentor for the College Board. She presents workshops for AP teachers throughout the United States. Marilee coached debate and her students won multiple state championships and placed at national tournaments she coached softball and boys golf and helped initiate the girls golf program in Utah. Marilee enjoys bowling, playing golf and pickleball and camping and riding ATVs with her family. She and her husband, Chris, have five children and 18 grandchildren. Their oldest granddaughter is attending SUU. Wow, what a resume, Marilee, that's amazing. Uh, thank you. So we'll have a question and answer section and we'll do that. Just go ahead and type in your questions that you have during the interview and I'll go back and read them and then we'll go over those at the end of the interview. So Marilee, I have to tell you, when I first heard your name, it sounded so familiar to me and I thought, how do I know her? And so I looked back at your bio and I saw that you were a Beaver High School teacher. And I have to tell you, I went to Beaver High for a couple of years. I have some Beaver High yearbook. Oh my goodness. So I went to Beaver High my seventh and eighth grade years. And you know what's funny is they titled this and that's final because we were supposed to be leaving that high school. Remember that? Yes. Old high school in Beaver. And then wow. they didn't get it done. <laughs> and the next year that they, they did the, are we there yet? Question mark yearbook. So anyway, I never had you as a teacher, but I do remember you as the softball coach because I had a friend who wanted to be the water girl on the softball team. And that sounded like so much fun to a little seventh grader. Mm -hmm. And so I came to one of your softball meetings with my uh, friend and I hadn't thought to ask my mom permission if I could join the softball team as a water girl. So anyway, then I went home and asked and she was like, yeah, no, let's not do that. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's incredible. That's so but I have cool. to show you, I have, you signed my yearbook. I got all the instructors that year to sign my yearbook and I have your signature in my yearbook. <laughs> wow, it is a small world, isn't it? Small world, huh? That was 26 years ago. And then wow. we moved, my family moved down to Laverk in Utah when I was starting ninth grade. So I never got to experience the new high school or I never had you as a teacher and I'm sad I would have loved having you as my teacher oh, I would love having you as a student as well I wish you could have stayed <laughs> <laughs> no it would have been fun I would have loved it um before we start um talk to me a little bit about how it's been for you during this COVID epidemic we've had um have you been teaching at SUU during this time no, I was an adjunct, which was my AP class that would get credit. So I okay. haven't been teaching, no. All right. So how do you like those AP classes when you've taught them? How have they been? Those were hard classes. I took a couple of those. I, I loved AP and I love teaching AP English teachers and helping them. But I have been involved with girls golf and I have been just crushed not having girls golf right now because we had a state championship team again this year, I'm sure. We won last year by 63 strokes. And oh we lost one gosh. seat here. And so I am so hoping that the kids are going to be able to sign enough 
petitions and have the people in the state talk to them and that we would, will be able to have our spring sports in June and July. Oh, I hope so that. too. Oh, yes, my kids, my kids hope so too. So where do you teach the girls golf? Are you still- I coach at Beaver. For high school? At the I Beaver, okay. Beaver, yes. See, and I didn't know that Beaver High had a golf team. So how cool is that? And I love that you started the girls golf team. That's awesome. Yes. It's been fun. We've had one now for 11 years. Okay, I remember that golf course and I took lessons up there. I was horrible. And I spent the time trying to find all the stray golf balls everywhere in the weeds. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't a very good golf student, but I am very impressed with people that can golf because it looks like a hard sport. It's a great sport. It teaches a lot more things than just athletics. So tell me, how are you dealing with being at home all the stay-at-home orders. What have you been doing to keep yourself entertained during all this time? Do you have any suggestions I, for entertainment? I, I stay busy. I, I golf a lot and I read a lot and I, I love audiobooks. Audiobooks can make cleaning the house or painting the wall an adventure. Instead oh, I'm with you. Audiobooks, they can go by fast. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big believer in audiobooks. Oh, um... So do you have any ideas for anybody in our audience watching today for, I don't know, have you seen anything, social media, any ideas of things to do while you're indoors? You go golfing. What about us that don't golf? Do you have any other ideas? Well, my granddaughter has done something and I've really admired her. She's going to be attending SUU, so I will have two granddaughters at SUU, which I'm, I'm very excited about. And she's made videos. She's made videos of things to do. And she's made videos of her family doing different things. And it was so exciting because her video was selected to be shown on channel two. So that was really exciting for our family. Oh. And we were watching the new news and all of a sudden, there we all were doing these crazy little things during the coronavirus. So, <laughs> so it's been fun to make movies and fun to stay home. But I've really, really missed being out with, with society. Oh yeah, I think we're social creatures. It's been hard. Yeah, it's been I don't know. So I it's been hard for me. I just want to see people, see people's faces. <laughs> so Mary Lee, I am so excited about this interview. I've been thinking about it all week, reading lots of things, getting more and more excited about what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be talking about a lot of symbolism, different things in literature. We have two books we're going to be talking about today. We've got Watchers, and we've got Jojo Moya's The Giver of Stars. And do you happen to have, you have those with you, don't you? Yes. Could you give us a show? I don't yeah. have them with oh, me. Do so this, is, this is one I'd like to talk about first. And Peyton mm -hmm. Madden, one of my former AP students, asked me if I would talk about a book. And I said, oh, Peyton, and he's just one of my favorite students. So how could he's I say no? How could I say no? So... I sent him a list of about 12 books, and I said, which one of these do you think I should talk about? And he said, oh my, I'm going to have to ask someone. So I thought about it, and I thought, that really wasn't fair. I need to choose. And it was really hard for me to select a book. That's been one of the hardest parts of this. I'm going to call it a calling, as we're going to talk about Joseph Campbell's ideas. But a couple of things kept happening in which it helped me decide to share this book. And this is one of those books that after you've read it, you set it down for a while, it just keeps sneaking back into your mind. And I just keep thinking about it. It's so cool because the main character is Einstein, the dog. And the people in this novel actually take such care to teach this dog to communicate. Every morning I walk with the sixth grade teacher and she was telling me that she assigned to her sixth grade kids to read Summer of the Monkeys. She wanted them to read a chapter out loud to someone. She said, find a parent or a sibling. And if your parent's not there and your parent can't listen to you, then maybe even just read it to one of your pets. So she said a little boy called her the next day and he said, Mrs. Joseph, I read a, a complete chapter of Summer of the Monkeys to my dog. And I know he understood 
every single word and I'm going to read to him more often. And I thought, yes, that's, that's watching. That's it. That's it. <laughs> and then talking of, of the coronavirus, I had golfed in Hurricane with my kids. My, my girls had had their first tournament. They had done so well. We were so excited. And then on the way home, we get a text that said, all spring sports are canceled until later notice and school is canceled tomorrow. And we were just crushed. And so the next day I received some texts from some students and even a family member who said, hey, have you heard about Dean Koontz? And I said, yes, I just read one of his books and I really like it. And they said, no, did you hear about his novel? And it's called The Eyes of Darkness. And I said, no. And so they sent me what looks like this. Maybe some of you have seen this. And it's so cool. This is a picture of the, the book. And it's called Eyes of Darkness. This was published in 1981. And on page, and I really like this, 333. Page 333. Oh, wow. It says, in around 2020, a severe pneumonia-like illness will spread throughout the globe attacking the lungs and the bronchial tubes and resisting all known treatments. Is that so incredible? That's crazy. And then on the other page over here on, on page 334, it says a Chinese scientist, Le Shen, created this and they call this stuff Wahoon 400 because it was developed at the RDNA labs outside of the city of Wahoo, and it was the 400th viable strain of man-made microorganisms created at that research laboratory. And they were like, Mrs. Air, Mrs. Air, what do you think about this? And I said, well, Dean Koontz is a fiction writer, and I think it's a pretty cool coincidence because, you know, we don't know that it was man-made, my dad used to vaccinate the cattle for the coronavirus when I was a kid. So yeah, it's been around in different strains. It didn't just come around. And, and so, you know, perhaps it came from bats. We don't know. But so I, I went on Amazon and thought, I'm just going to buy a copy of this book so I can show it when we have our, this visit today. Well, a hardback copy is $500. What? And the paperbacks were $50, but they've reprinted oh. them all, mm -hmm. made a second batch or third batch, or I don't know how many batches, but now they're only about $38 and the cover's different. But Dean Koontz also predicted Ebola in Africa in 2014. So does he have so, like a time machine? I mean, talk about a good financial investment to predict something and then it becomes well known and everybody wants your book 39 years later. <laughs> so that's just so cool. But I thought, wow, 39 years later. And as I thought about 39 and the kids, of course, my students are always finding symbolisms of, of 13 for me. They're like, Mrs. Air, that's three times 13. And I said, yes. And it was on page 333. So that reminded me of the importance of symbolism of number 13. And as a teacher, the kids, I would say, so what's, what's important about the number 13? And they would always say, oh, it's a, it's a symbol of bad luck. And I'm like, no, it's not. I want, I want to show you guys something. 13 is actually a magical number, a very important number, because it is the number of transformation and rebirth. And they're like, oh, sure. And I said, yes. Pull out a symbol that you have in your pocket. And this is a symbol that my Hi. dad, awesome, my dad, who is 91, carries his little money clip on his heart every day. And it's got a dollar bill in it, not because he goes a lot of places, but in case one of the grandkids stop by, he would like to be able to buy them an all day sucker or a milk nickel. <laughs> Oh, so that's adorable. <laughs> to his heart. So anyway, it's full of the number 13 and it's so cool. So if we look on this, this is the great seal of the United States on the back. And on the right side, 
there's actually a pyramid here. And if we look at the pyramid closely, and when I would teach this in my class, I would make it bigger, <clears throat> I'd make a big copy for the kids, big enough that it couldn't fit in the pot machine. So <laughs> Good idea. Yes. I don't want to encourage but, that. <laughs> but it's really cool because it shows a pyramid. And a pyramid is a symbol of transformation and rebirth because in Egypt every year when they have the floods, when the Nile River recedes, then the pyramids appear and it's safe for the people to plant and have their gardens and be reborn. And on this pyramid, if we stand down at the bottom of it, on one side or the other, we can only see that side. And the, the base of the pyramid represents the four points of the compass. So we have north, south, east, and west. If someone were to walk over to the side of the pyramid and look around, they could only see two sides. However, if they climb to the top, then they could see in all directions and the eye of the God of reason will open as they can see everything from there. And it's really cool because how many levels do you think there are on this pyramid? If you well, want to say 13. Exactly. Without <laughs> even counting them, listen to you, there are 13. And I'm a quick you, learner. <laughs> you are. I'm, I am impressed. I wish I could have taught you, Nicole. <laughs> I wish I could have had you as a teacher. So this eye of God is looking forward. And if we look at the pyramid, behind it is the desert that represents all of the wars that the world had experienced before America was created. But in front of it, we have the gardens and the plants and the flowers that the eye of God is looking towards because the United States is based on the idea of rebirth and new life. And we want to put all of those wars behind us. At the bottom of this pyramid is a Roman numeral. And it's, it's kind of fun because kids nowadays don't know how to read Roman numerals very well. So this Roman numeral, if you look at it, I'm going to have to put glasses on to look there at you it. It's really small, <laughs> no matter how big we can make this. <laughs> but it's the Roman numeral of, nine, of 1776. Why 1776? Oh, I see that. On that bottom of the pyramid, that very bottom one. I've never noticed yeah. that before. Yeah, because that's when we declared our independence, right? And if we take, and I, I like to tell the kids, well, a symbol can stand for more than one thing. So if you take 1776, see this, and you put a plus sign between each of these numbers. Oh, this isn't going to show up very well. But one plus seven plus seven plus six, what does that equal? Oh, I just saw the answer. It was 26. Was 20, it 26? So one plus seven is eight plus eight. seven. 15 it's, plus 16. 15, 21. 21. What's important? I should have my glasses still on. <laughs> <laughs> What's important? I know. I have to have mine all the time. What's important about the number 21? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, well, it's divided by three. I'm trying to think. 21. Uh, you get to, at 21, you get to legally drink. There you I go. I'm thinking 21. <laughs> Excellent, <laughs> excellent. It's the age of reason. It is. And if we look okay, yeah. at what's written here in, in Latin, it shows a new order of the world. And he smiles on our accomplishments. And then in the middle, it says, in God we trust, which is so cool. So that's one side of the great seal. Any questions on that one? Holy cow, that was a lot of symbolism that I didn't even know was in there. I've seen that, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, it's a pyramid. And, and my family and I did watch National Treasure the other day, and they did talk about the back of the dollar bill in that movie. You know, we've been yeah. watching lots of movies during this COVID thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> Those movies are helping to keep us sane right now, aren't they? Yes, sure. yes, they are. And there's some real gems out there that you forget about, and it was fun to watch again. There are, Absolutely. So, and, and hopefully today's what we talk about will help us to look at those movies maybe in a little bit different way. 
So this is the other side of the Great Seal of the United States. And we always see this when the president talks. It's above him, above his head, or, or usually on the podium. So that every time we see the president, we should see the Great Seal of the United States, which I think is so cool. And this shows that an eagle, and an eagle is important as it is our national bird. It's the bird of the highest god, Zeus. And this eagle comes down into a world of opposites and into a world of time, into the realm of time. And as this eagle comes down here, notice in his claws, he has a laurel leaf. And then in his other claw, he has arrows. So how many leaves do you think are on that laurel leaf? Ooh, I want to guess 13. You're right. so good. Yes. 13. <laughs> Laurel leaves represent peace. But in his other hand, he has 13 arrows. But which way is this eagle looking? Well, he's looking to my left, but he's looking towards the all-seeing eye. He's looking that at the laurel leaf, isn't he? He's looking at the leaves. Oh, Not yes, yes, yes. Arrows. I, I was up. putting him way too far looking at the other <laughs> symbol. <laughs> yeah, not actually looking, but facing. That's my fault. Facing right. is a much better word. So he's, he's facing the, the laurel leaves because he, like on the other side of the Great Seal, where we put the, the real life and the plants in front of us, he's looking towards peace, that the laurel leaves represent peace. And, and that comes from some cool stories in mythology as well. But in order to have peace, we have to have the strongest army in the world to back that up with our 13 arrows, don't we? And there's all yes, kinds of fun 13s on, on this eagle as we count the stripes and things. And there are nine feathers representing the judicial system as how many Supreme Court judges are there? <clears throat> Must be nine. Nine. You know, I never counted. Nine, yep, nine support. So lots of judicial systems with nine. But if we look above this eagle, we'll see right here, 13 stars in the shape of the Star of David. And this oh, is- wow, really yes. Cool. It's small, but it's actually the Star of David made from two big triangles. But there's 13 stars. And if the kids, if we put the Star of David also and draw it on the board, they can count 13 points as well. And this, before it was the Star of David, or if we read in Arabian Nights, it was actually Solomon's seal. And Solomon used to take monsters and people and put them in jars. And then he would take this seal, picture the star, put on the top and seal these monsters and, and things in. So that someday if you're walking along the beach and you happen to have a, a bottle wash ashore and you rub it and the seal opens, genie? But a genie might appear, absolutely. So Solomon's seal, but with all of, all of these stars and this is where we get the Pythagorean theorem, where we get trigonometry, A squared plus B squared, equals c squared and there are 12 points on the star of david but at the inside is the apex which is the creative center which is the highest point from which everything can be seen so i like to show this to my kids and then i ask them so was it planned or a coincidence that we have 13 colonies Oh, I was thinking there are 13 colonies that kept repeating. There's 13 colonies. Yep. Um, 13 colonies. I don't know. I want to say it was planned. Is it planned? Okay. And Joseph Campbell, who's, who has shared these ideas, they, these are actually Masonic symbols that are in the library of, of our forefathers, of Thomas Jefferson. And that's where the, the symbols are, are found. And you can you know, look them up and find that this is what they stand for. But yes, it, it was planned because all of these colonies could fit into one state the size of Texas. So then I like to have my kids, I say, all right, I want you to go home. Don't get on the internet because everything has an opposite. And look and see what you can find. And it's so cool 
because as Christ met with his 12 apostles, 12 plus him, at the Last Supper, and then in three days he was resurrected, and there are 13 full moons in a year, which is pretty cool because sometimes we just see 12, but there are actually 13. See, I didn't know that. When is the extra one? I figure there's one a month, but where does the extra one come in? It's, if you figure the days, there are always 13. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so There's symbolism everywhere. <laughs> and 13 grades in school, 12 grades plus kindergarten, 12 jurors and a judge, 13 levels on Utah's beehive, 13 stripes in the, in the flag, Teenagers, of course, when they turn 13, we see some big changes. <laughs> oh, <we>? yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's a huge change. <laughs> At least around um, my house. <laughs> exactly. And one of my favorites is I love to play the piano. And in an octave, there's eight white keys octave. But there are also five black Ooh. ones. So okay, that 13. 13. I didn't even realize there were so many 13s everywhere. I always think but, unlucky number 13. Yeah, but it's not. It's actually a very sacred number. Transformation and rebirth. Twelve Aztec skies. Uh, Thirteen articles of faith. Thirteen knots on a hangman's noose because he's definitely experiencing a transformation. Oh, thirteen wow. cards in a, a suit. You know, thirteen different cards in a suit of playing cards. Thirteen famines in the Bible. These are just cool, cool things that my kids have found and something that they were really excited about because we were studying the symbols on the dollar bill, was there are 13 pieces of currency. Counting oh. the coins and counting the bills. And that's what the, oh, kids, that's crazy. the kids found. And I thought that was really, really cool. And also that 12, is. <laughs> 12 steps to sobriety with, with the 12 steps programs for, that, that helps, oh. helps people who struggle. Well, I'm going to be looking out for that 13 from now on. That's something I had never even noticed or realized before. I'm going to be noticing that from now on. Yeah, you you know for 13. And let me know if you find some more that my kids haven't found. So it's pretty cool because in this book, when Travis asks Nora to marry him, he actually talks about a pyramid. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's crazy. Why would anyone else mention a pyramid when you're trying to convince someone to marry you? So it's, it's just fun how all of these symbols are just embedded in this book. So oh, I love, I love symbolism. So you and I have been talking a lot about the different symbolism. We've been talking a lot about Joseph Campbell back and forth and everything he taught. Now, Joseph Campbell was born in 1904 and he loved stories and he loved myths and he loved all these things he was finding out. I love mythology. It's one of my favorite things to study. And then he started noticing that there was a common pattern among all of these stories. And so he put that together and he put together the book, A Hero of a Thousand Faces, which is what I've been reading just diligently all week. I've been loving it. That's been mm -hmm. such an awesome book. I'm so excited that you have been reading that. I started SUU as a business major and I started taking some English classes and Dr. David Lee kept saying, well, you need to be an English major. And he said, I know you really like mythology. So I said, I, I want you to read this book. And he gave me Hero with a Thousand Faces. I took that book, I read it, and I brought it back and I said, I'm ready to be an English major. That book changed my life. I, I love Dave Lee, he was my favorite English teacher. And it was just such a great experience for me. And it's changed the way that I look at everything. Joseph Campbell was a philosopher who went to every culture and every tribe in the world and he had them tell in his stories wouldn't that be fun oh what a fantastic job i thought i could do that i would love, love that for an occupation there are so many stories from all over the world religious stories myth stories just fables everything that we hear they're just they're stories that have been carried on through time there are and what he found was that every culture had the same story. So he created the monuments. All of them had the same story, but the characters were different. 
So Joseph Campbell found that each of the heroes would have a departure called from an oracle, something beyond this world. And then they would leave where they were comfortable, go somewhere else. And with them, they would have a protective figure. And then he would come up against a threshold of some kind and, and there would be a guardian there and, and he would have to pass a series of tests in order to get through. And then he would go into the initiation and we, we see kids have initiation to get into clubs till the day a hero has to go through a series of trials. And while this hero is going, must be aided by the advice of secret agents of the supernatural. And Joseph Campbell was one of the main helpers in writing Star Wars. You see this so much in the Star Wars trilogy. And then the hero has to return. And it's not always easy for the hero to return. And my kids have been able to relate, well, if I take this and, and they're like, oh, okay, whatever. And I says, well, let's, let's look at a couple of ideas. What if we look at a Mormon missionary? Does a Mormon missionary receive a call from an oracle? Okay, yes. and does she have a protective figure while she's gone? Mm -hmm. Is a missionary ever alone? No, has a companion always. <laughs> always has a companion. My, my grandson who was in New Zealand and his mission was cut short, they just told me four days earlier, we're going to send you home and he was crushed. But oh. he was at home on a plane full of missionaries, so he was never alone. But on his mission then, he had to, to leave where he was comfortable, went across the ocean to a faraway land with a protective figure, and he had to prove that he was worthy, maybe to his mission president, what, whatever, but he had to, to be worthy, and then he had to, while he was there, he experienced several trials. Everything isn't easy. It was the first time he'd ever been away from home. He just graduated from high school pretty much and, and left. Oh, that's scary going to New Zealand. That's a long way from home. It was a long flight and he had never seen the ocean. Oh, wow. He grew up in <laughs> my introduction to the ocean. <laughs> he grew up in Minersville on a farm and had never seen the ocean. So then as this Mormon, this Mormon missionary would go through a series of trials, but during this, he'd have to have advice of the secret agent, which they, they pray and then they also have the help of the Holy Ghost. And then the missionaries return. And is it easy for them to return? Yeah, it's not. A lot of times it isn't. A lot of them, it's hard. It's My, hard to re-enter into that world after what you've been going through. And my yes. I had three brothers that served missions themselves, and I watched them go through that. And it's hard. Back into society. It is hard. My grandson had to live in the camp trailer for 14 days before he could even go <laughs> with his family because that was part of his isolation. So he had oh, quite a chance to come back. That's so hard. You want to come back and just be with family, and then you have to be isolated. Yeah. <laughs> But, but Joseph Campbell's hero adventure is also just a pattern of growth, life, and experience for all of us. I would tell my kids, well, what about every day? Who wakes you up? Do you just wake up or is it a call? And then you come into my classroom, you cross over the threshold. If you're in AP, you had to go through a series of, of challenges to get in AP. You had mm -hmm. to have some prerequisites. But you did have a protective figure. I tried to take good care of you while you were there. But there were some trials and, and you know, it was, it was a challenge. And the kids had, had some help from each other. A little bit of supernatural. You always like to study some things with, with magic. And then- oh, the magic's everywhere. Return. In all the writings. I'm gonna show, I have a little printout of the hero's journey I did. You can see Oh, that's that. wonderful. I thought that was good. Will you leave on your journey? And I was talking with my husband about it. And every story I was thinking, I was thinking the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, all Absolutely. those different ones. One those of are my, some good examples. One of my favorite, have the kids do in the spring, 
was filled with dreams because it's been a long time since they've seen that movie and a lot of the kids. Oh, is that the one with Kevin Costner? With the cornfield. And with the cornfield and he no. plays the baseball team because they will come. I love that and movie. And had to listen to the voice. And everyone yes. thought it was crazy, but, but he fulfilled what he wanted to. Some of my, oh, my favorites, like the Lion King, like the Karate Kid, like Up. So Disney does this a lot. But they do do this a lot. So it's really I'm thinking Dumbo, Pinocchio. I was thinking this through Little Mermaid. I was thinking all these different ones that they've gone through. It's totally this Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Absolutely. And so in here we have several characters that experience a change. And it's a big change. And, and it's not just physical change, but it's mental change, more so mental change. That's what's kind of cool because he writes a lot about telepathy. And the, the novel that he wrote, The Eyes of Darkness, wasn't as believable as this one. This one's more believable. It's still fiction, but it's more believable, I believe, than The Eyes of Darkness. Of darkness and that that leads to this book as well and this book is right. so cool and it, this one's more pg that other one was a disclaimer it was more adult themed yeah. stronger language so beware on that one yes this one has a yeah, few I've been loving this one. a few evil characters so when vince and it's so cool because he starts out and he'll say the character's name so when they talk about vince skip a few pages or fast forward <laughs> and the outsider. Character. <laughs> and the outsider. But the characters who are good, and it's like the ego coming down into the world of opposites. There's the evil characters, Vince and the outsider. But there's the good characters, Einstein and Nora. And Einstein, Patrick. Nora. Yes, I love them. They're great characters. I love the character Nora in there. She's fun. Just She's to see her transformation through the novel. And a definite, definite allusion or indirect reference to Ibsen's The Doll, A Doll's House. Oh. And with the same okay. name with, with Nora. So it's just cool. There's so many things going on besides just a really good story in this book. And then this book doesn't have the bad language. It doesn't have the evil characters, but it does have some evil characters. But it's a, a really good book. And it talks about when the W... Uh, it's really cool. It tells us here, Eleanor Roosevelt, and she wanted all of the kids to be able to have books. So it was like the WPA uh, Pack Horse Library. So mm -hmm. five women in there got on pack horses and went to the backwoods in Kentucky. And they, they rode these horses to places where, you know, the people just could never leave and get to town and they would take them new books every week. Oh, that just sounds amazing to me because I was looking at that, how that's historical fiction going over the place. And I thought, what a dangerous thing because back then there wasn't just roads to get you places. You had to go through the woods. And as a woman riding a horse, the was I, oh, and a little dangerous. <laughs> some of them had never ridden before and they had to learn to carry guns. And the sacrifices they made, the trials they faced to see that mothers, and fathers and children could get books during the depression. And what a great Amazing. sacrifice. That is. And I've heard that this has been optioned for a film. Now, Jojo Moya, she's done a lot of books. She's done the Me Before You series. That was made into a movie, the Me Before You. So she's well known. She's made some really good novels. I'm a fan. I really like her writing a lot. So I'm excited to read that one. You've actually given me a lot of material to read and I've been loving it. Oh, good. <laughs> good. And like you asked at the beginning, what have you been doing during the coronavirus? And it's such a wonderful time for us to read. And mm -hmm. good things can come out of this virus. I talked to my librarian who is, again, one of my AP students from a few years back. And she said right now, even though the library isn't officially open, that she's actually checked out more books than ever, that people have called her and she's met him out at the curb and, and people in yeah, I, are reading. So, oh, that's good. Because I had heard that. I got that notice in my email that library was doing pickup. And I've had books on hold since before spring break. And we were out of town for spring break when everything started, you know, 
closing down. And so then I got home and I thought, well, I better go get my books. And then I went to the library and it was closed. <laughs> so I was able to go yesterday and go get all my homes. And it was so exciting. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I'm, my books. I'm sure you just can't wait to start reading those. Oh, I know. And I keep putting more books on hold. I'm like, okay, now I've got to read this. I got to read The Eyes of Darkness. Got to do that one for sure because how crazy that he was able to predict that so long ago. Yeah, and it, like I said, it's not as believable as Watchers. If you have your choice, read this one. It's just so good. It really is. And I'm halfway book. done with that one. And I have been loving that one. That's a fantastic one. And the second half is the best. I cried. It has a happy ending. It, it ends so well. But it, taught, it teaches the dog to communicate. And I think now during the coronavirus, when we're home together, it's so important that we communicate. We need to communicate with others. And as is shown in this book, Joseph Campbell talks about this eagle that comes down into the world of opposites. And he said it also creates three types of relationships when it comes into this realm of time. And he said it's this against that, that against this, or they can both come and work together and help each other. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've heard that in the red-black game. Have you ever heard of that, the red-black game? I haven't. Oh, that's a good one. Where it's one over the other, or you can come together and choose to just get along. And Anyway, it's a good game. Someday. Oh, cool. And it just matches <laughs> your outfit, that's darling. It does. I just thought <laughs> that. That's so cool. But in this one... Dean Coots actually talks about these relationships, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I know he's just studied Campbell's ideas, which are so cool, but think about it, you know, dominant, and, and then the change of the dominance and coming together, and right now, I think that it's so cool that as we're talking about, right now, we're at the apex or the high point of the coronavirus. We're talking about going back out into society, and the CEO of Samsung has actually sat down with the CEO from Apple. And they have found that something that could help everyone would be if when we go out, and, and they are, they've made this so it is possible, that if someone is tested positive, if they will hand their phone it will show everyone that they've come into contact with over six feet in the last two weeks. And then those people would know that they have been, you know. Exposed, yeah, because you are curious. It's and hard to know. Everyone that they have been exposed to has been exposed. So if people, and it's true, our, our world, our, our country is based on democracy and choice. People don't have to give that up, but I would be more than willing to help all of the people whom I have come into contact with. Also, wearing masks, we will help everyone if we wear masks. They're not for us, but mm -hmm. they're for others. And I feel that a way that we can help defeat this coronavirus is to think about others besides ourselves before ourselves. We need to wear our masks because masks work as kind of a barrier sometimes we think, oh, that guy's a little weird. He's wearing a mask. Instead, we need to think, he's wearing that mask for me. And if, That's if we a great can, way to look at it. And if we can help each other. And in this book, it's just so cool. He even has, he starts the last section off with the title Guardian. Mm -hmm. which definitely. Which is a Joseph Campbell thing. <laughs> and this is what he says. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends from the gospel according to St. John. And isn't it wonderful if we can love each other and help each other, and then we can do, as President Wyatt has said, we can make, things can be better because of the coronavirus we can actually make oh. things better and become a better people because of this challenge. I love that. You know, I have wondered too, is handshaking going to become a thing that's happened in the past and now we'll be fist bumping or 
elbow. Like I thought, how is this world going to look different after the coronavirus? Are we going to be healthier during the winter because we'll be more conscious of each other and our germs and stay home when we're sick? I think that's a huge thing. If we can just admit that we're sick and we should stay home and not spread the love, so to speak, when we go outdoors. Exactly. Exactly. So this, this book also has a lot of allusions, which mm -hmm. is an indirect reference to another book. And I lay awake the other night wondering why the evil characters, because they are really evil. And then I thought, okay, it's because of Dante's Inferno. And this character mm -hmm. goes down and just keeps getting worse and worse. So, so Vince alludes to Dante's Inferno, as well as Grendel going against Beowulf. Again, where we've got the opposites, the good against evil. Mm -hmm. And then... An another allusion in there is the outsider. So in this lab, they have, have genetically engineered a dog that's just all of the goodness, but they also genetically engineered, and the, the novel will tell you why, an evil, everything that was evil. The opposite. Just mm -hmm. the opposite. The yin and the yang. So this is, this is the Grindel. This is everything bad. And... This, but this character, because he was created, is an allusion to Frankenstein. And it's kind mm -hmm. of cool because I love Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It's one of my favorite novels to teach my junior class. And the kids always said, oh, they always felt sorry for the, mo the monster. They always wished that someone would have taken the monster, loved it, cared for it. But it just knew, you know, because we judged society at that time judged people by their looks, that this monster was not accepted no matter what he did, no matter how hard he tried, no matter how smart he was. And that's kind of like the outsider is here. No matter how bad he is, there's still that little part of us that wants to feel sorry for him. Mm. So mm -hmm. that, that love that's that we That's on my read list. Yes, it teaches. I think you can learn so much from novels. You can really learn empathy for other characters and seeing their struggles. And that lets us be kinder to people yeah. that we just don't know very well or judge too harshly or judge too quickly. So Absolutely. we are, we're running out of time. This has been so fun, Marilee. I uh, love talking with you. You are so fun and I've enjoyed this so much. I just want to say, would it be possible in 39 years from now, to have a dog that could actually understand and communicate with us. Not, not actually speaking, mm -hmm. but it's so cool. You need to read this book to see how they taught this dog to communicate. I wonder, is he predicting something for the future? <laughs> so, you know what? Possible. I noticed, yes, definitely. And you know, and you had put two in some notes comparing Nora to Emily Dickinson and, um, I loved that, and I actually have, I just Aww. read this just a couple of, and I took it a year because it's so full of so much, and you can't just read through poetry. No. You have to take a poem, and you have to feel, you have to, like, be with it, but Absolutely. I just, I had really learned a lot about Emily Dickinson this last year, and how she was just a recluse. Like she reminds me of Nora, just lived in her own little world. And Nora was a painter and Absolutely. created all these beautiful things. And who knew Emily Dickinson, the crazy Emily Dickinson, <laughs> some kind of room was creating something that would last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Emily. Her poetry is just beautiful. And Emily wrote hundreds of poems and she shared one with a friend and she said, do you think this is good enough to be published? And he says, oh, I don't think so. So she put all of hers away and stayed there. But Nora, after a while, dared to share her paintings with Travis. And he loved mm -hmm. them. She hadn't even liked them. She had been repainting over canvases because she didn't have enough. And so she lost a lot of beautiful paintings, much like Emily Dickinson did. Yeah. So I would like to end with, one of Emily Dickinson's poems that's my favorite that I required every one of my students to memorize, if that's okay. Ooh, I would love it. So Emily Dickinson, there is no frigate like a book to take us lands away. 
nor any courtiers like a page of prancing poetry. This traverse may the poorest take without a press of toll. How frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Oh, that is beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. See, I read her and I just have to sit with it and I'll read it a few times and I'll fill it different stanzas, the different ones and how they make me feel. And she's just a wonderful poet. Oh, yes. thank you. Thank yes. you for sharing. So, so thank you. Yes, yes. thank you, Marilee. This has been so fun. So, oh. thanks for, oh, sorry. Yeah, Haven. Oh, I'll just go ahead. So, thanks for tuning in today. Thanks, Marilee, for sharing with us. It has been delightful. I've absolutely loved it. So thanks for tuning in for Community Reads. Join us every Tuesday at 2 as we interview authors and community leaders as they share with, with us their favorite reads. Future guests will include Iron County Superintendent Shannon Delaney, long-distance runner and motivational speaker Corey Reese, and St. George News reporter Kelsey Cook. Check out our site, suu.edu forward slash keeplearning.com for a complete list of our upcoming guests. And next week, I will be interviewing SUU professor Todd Robert Peterson and talking about his book, It Needs to Look Like We Tried. And I, you know what, now that libraries are opening back up in a way, you can actually get it a copy. And so this is it. If you want to get it and join us next week as we're talking about his novel. And um, the libraries are open up for curbside pickup on hold. So go online. And if you can, put that book on hold with your library card. And also know you can digitally borrow audio and ebook copies of books from the library through Overdrive and Libby. Information on how to do that is also on our site. So until next time, take some downtime to relax and read a good book. You deserve it. From SUU's Continuing Academic and Enrichment Department, we are Community Reads. Be wise, keep learning. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Haven. Yep. Thank you. Thank you guys, I would just like to add that. Barely. Find all of our um, videos on our YouTube channel, Be Wise, Keep Learning. The website, again, is seu.edu slash keep learning. And thank you to everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks.